Hey guys, we're back. This is the Craft Beer Storm podcast. Uh, I'm Michael from Barra Brewing Company in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Glorious Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And uh, we have a, a great guest on today. He's helped me out tremendously. His name is Bill Herlica. He is the owner of Brewer Consulting Brewer. He's helping breweries uh, you know, across the Northeast uh, with what they need uh, in terms of equipment and also uh, establishing a brewery he has a lot of uh, he has a lot of knowledge because he's also the founder of White Birch Brewing, uh, who was you know at one point distributed in thirteen states. And this guy you know started it from scratch. So it's it's a great podcast today. You'll you'll learn a lot. So stay tuned and uh, here we go. And today we're joined by Bill Herlica. He's the uh, uh, owner of Brewer Consulting Brewer, and he's formerly uh, the founder of White Birch Brewing in uh, Hookset, New Hampshire. Uh, Bill, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Michael. I know Bill has helped me out a lot with, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to expand the brewery, so he's given me a lot of good advice, and I figured I'd have him on the uh, on the podcast, and we'll have an episode uh, dedicated to him and his efforts. Uh, so, Bill, I want to start out with... Um, with your story, you know, how did you get started into brewing? Uh, you know, where are you now? What are you up to? And so forth. Sure. I started making beer in 1994. I bought a kit at the second annual Boston Beer Festival. I think the festival made it to four years and stopped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the kit was a travesty to beer kind, um, an English brown ale. I get the intent of what they were doing, but the output was awful. I just got fascinated by fermentation, so I uh, found a homebrew shop and started working with the owner there. He had a great approach, you know. I said, "Dude, I want to make something easy." He's like, "Well, all beer is a process. What do you want to drink?" I'm like, "Uh, uh." You know, back in 94, it was a whole different world than oh, today. Yeah. So, you know, I talked to him about some of the stronger flavors I'd had, some of the beers I was trying, and he suggested Belgian ales. I'm like, what's a Belgian beer? And he hooked me up with a kit, told me what to do. I made the beer, followed the steps. It was amazing. It was a Belgian strong golden ale. I didn't know beer could taste that good. I didn't know beer could taste <laughs> like that. And you so don't know until back. you try these different uh, styles. You know, a lot of like the, that's one of the reasons why I started this podcast because a lot of, uh, you know, Americans are, are just used to these lagers, these, these watery lagers. Uh, not that all lagers are, are bad because I, I, I love a lot of lagers, like the German lagers and there's certain lagers, but um, the mainstream seems to be these lagers. And that that's what the impression of, Beer, that's what they, they think beer is, but there's just so, there's like 90 different styles, correct me if I'm wrong, in like subcategories. Well, it depends. Do you want to talk about the BJCP style guidelines or do you want to go by the awards category at the GABF, which I think is over 200 at this point? Right. Um, you know, the, the beer market, well, I mean, since you talk about styles, it seems to be two major trends today. The macro trend, uh, global entities, you know, the same two or three basic profiles, kind of hard to tell each other apart on a blind taste test. Quality is amazing. I've traveled all over the U.S. The beer tastes the same everywhere. Um, distribution channels are unparalleled in the world. Again, it's commitment to quality and freshness. Um, but it's, it's a single note flavor. And then you have the IPA and in the craft beer world, everything called an IPA gets people's interest. Unfortunately, we're seeing a loss of interest in all of the styles that are out there. And, you know, America's craft brewers have kind of taken over the mantle of keeper of the world's styles. And we're kind of losing some of that in the marketplace today, which is a little disappointing. I hope that trend 
veers back. And I guess you're talking about what the, the gravitation towards IPAs and like everybody's making IPAs. And now we have the New England style IPA, which is really cloudy and everybody wants to make a New England style. Is that what you're talking about or? Yeah. I mean, when I opened up White Birch Brewing in 2009, I was self-distributing. And, you know, particularly when I broke into the Massachusetts market in 2010, you'd go into a store and, you know, you'd, you'd find a selection of classic New England craft brews, you know, shipyards, Woodstocks, um, you know, some smaller main brewers. You'd find Harpoon, Sam Adams for sure. But there weren't many locals because, you know, in 2009, I was brewery number 13 in New Hampshire. Um, there weren't a lot of breweries. There weren't even 1,200. Only in Massachusetts and select enthusiast stores did you see up to 30, maybe 40% of the market say IPA. The rest of it was Belgians' imports, which have almost disappeared. Um, you know, English styles, uh, porters, pale ales, um, you know, there was a lot more stuff out there. Hefeweizens. Um, it really was just a, a mix of, of styles. IPA was definitely a strong category by its own, but it didn't own the store. And now when I go around and I check out beer stores, the same stores I've sold to for years. Um, I sold my brewery in 2016, so I haven't sold in two years, but I still... I'm on the road all the time. Um, you know, IPA is upwards of 60 to 70% of some stores. Imports, you know, they went from 16 square feet down to 8 square feet, down to 4 square feet, and in some stores it's down to one or two four-foot shelves. I mean, classics, world classics just aren't sold anymore because people aren't buying them. Right. I think that's the, you know, a testament to the trend of of people looking locally for for beer as well. I mean, the IPAs are, are very popular, but also, you know, actually in the recent months, uh, a lot of national breweries uh have have gone away, you know. We had one locally who uh, just expanded, you know, I guess beyond their means and then uh unfortunately they uh they closed up. They got taken over, uh, and then we had, um, you know, Green Flash was out in out that west, uh, who who had awesome beer. You know, they still have awesome beer, and they uh, went national. They opened a beautiful new facility in, um, you know, Virginia Beach, and then you heard that uh, they're not going to open that. They're going to close it, and then you heard they're going to be. Uh, uh, you know, they're going to pull out of thirty three states, and then. And eventually they got taken over by some VC guys. So you're seeing more of a local trend. I guess that, do you think that that would be uh, uh contribute to where people don't want, um, you know, beer, I guess, even imported beer? Uh, yes and no. I think that simplifies things. You know, for example, it's, uh, it's early July, 2018, as we record this. And today, uh, yesterday, sorry, I was talking with someone in the industry. Six Point pulled out of the market in New Hampshire. I didn't notice. Oh, wow. I've done events with Six Point. I've enjoyed their beer. Uh, they're a good brewery out of New York. Right. Um, and Firestone Walker has pulled out of the uh, state as well. And their beers are, are high quality. Their beers are quite tasty, but they're not moving. Um, right. You know, I don't think you can claim or, or lay that at the feet of buying local solely as as the issue, because I think that simplifies the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does point to an opportunity, which is the uh, interest, growing interest in uh, sourced closer to home beers. It's right. not unlike what we saw with the uh, farm to table movement in restaurants. I think in many ways we're very much staring at that taking hold in a way that um, we need to, as an industry, 
figure out. Right. I mean, uh, well, we use, uh, you know, Bear Brewing Company, we use a lot of local products and people love it. You know, we combine, we collaborate with, uh, there's a local, uh, you know, CB Honey and, and Rye has uh, honey bees. And then also, um, you know, uh, we use maple syrup from Barrington, uh, local coffee. They love the local collaboration, kind of the farm to table thing. So people are sure. people are, are trending that way. And I think it's it's kind of a national trend. That's what I was talking about, the local. I didn't realize Firestone Walker pulled out too. I mean, they make awesome beer. Well, it just goes to show that, you know, having awesome beer isn't the only answer. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when was the last time you saw a six-point rep doing an event in the state of New Hampshire? Right. It's tough. It's tough. If you expand, you know, into other states, you got to have salespeople there on the ground and, uh, you know, pushing your product. And, um, you know, I'm seeing it more and more as, you know, these these are two, two... Two other examples of just uh, brewers that are outside the state being uh, pulling back, you know, becoming more local. So, um, yeah, you mentioned about the the quality of the. Um, I mean, the quality of these mass produced beers is you know you could have a beer in you know here or you can go to California, it would taste the same, and that's you know a, a kind of a testament to the quality control, the high quality control. And that's what you know, I was talking, well, um, I've been emailing back and forth with Mitch Steele, who was uh, formerly Stone's master brewer. And now he's in New Realm. Actually, New Realm is going to take over that uh, Virginia Beach facility. Uh, sure. And yeah. and Mitch Steele, when I first met him, was uh, you know, a head brewer at Budweiser here in Merrimack. Right. Right. And he, he just kept saying, you know, I mean, the, the quality control there and the quality of the beer is fantastic. I mean, if you want to know about quality uh, and, and, you know, replication that, you know, that that's they have they have it down, you know. Uh, sure. Which is interesting. I mean, oh, my gang. Uh, when I was doing the Belgium comes to Cooperstown a few years ago, I did a podcast uh, with Jimmy's number 43 and I followed the new head brewer at oh my gang, who happened to be. Uh, former Budweiser head brewer. Nice yeah. guy. Yeah. And Oma Gang got uh, bought out by Duvel, I believe. Well, this was after Duvel bought him. Oh. oh, this is after. Okay. Oh, yeah. They were putting in a $6 million or $3 million canning line. Still sitting in the crates, and they tried to tell us it wasn't anything, and we all just got to laugh like, yeah, that's nothing. <laughs> sure. <laughs> But tell, have, but it's um, a hell of a facility too. It's worth a visit. Now, also, you're involved with selling uh, beer equipment. You help uh, brewer, you know, brewers that want to open breweries. Uh, uh, you know, with um, you know, with getting new equipment, you can supply them with that. Maybe you want to go into that a little bit. Sure, I do a lot of work with American Beer Equipment, and depending on what you're looking to do and how you want to work with me. I can set you up with a turnkey brewery. I could also do, you know, uh, help you with navigating, setting up a lab for quality control, uh, kitchens, brew pub sittings, turning a space that was never intended to be a brewery into a brewery. Um, you know, I, I have a Six Sigma black belt, so processing the methodology for managing process is something I have a lot of experience with. So when I walk into a space, it's not just put a tank here, you're good. It, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to people about workflow, space for the workflow, um, customer sight lines and experience. Um, what do you see as you walk in? They're all very different hats, but they all have to, work together so that people feel like, hey, this place is awesome. And people that work there are like, hey, this place is awesome. I can't wait to go to work again. Yeah, I mean, and, and you, you bring up the point about setting up a brewery. I mean, it, it takes a lot of cash and a lot of effort. And a lot of people, you know, one of the other things we're trying to, to um, promote with this this podcast is that, you're, you know, your local brewer, I mean, brewing kicks your butt you know, from, from start to finish. And it's not like you add powder to water and, uh, 
you know, all of a sudden, poof, there's beer. There's just a huge process, you know, and to get that thing up and running. I mean, I, myself personally, I mean, I, I put a lot of money into just, you know, transforming a shell into, uh, you know, to, into a brewery and tap room. We're still alive, which is great, you know, and we are producing, like I can't produce enough now. Uh, whatever we make, we sell, which is great. They say it's a good problem, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it's a good problem. I think it's, it's a problem that we need to solve somehow. But um, what are the challenges? What other challenges you think uh, that brewers have today? Um, that's another. Well, I mean, you know, it depends on where you are in the life cycle. Startup is a huge issue. Most people have no experience with permitting processes. You're going into a highly regulated industry. Um, a lot of hoops, a lot of things to do. And you can't just assume that the town's going to welcome you with open arms. No. Yeah. Um, and there's different levels. Like there's the TTB, which is the federal license. And, um, you know, they won't even look at you until you sign a lease. So you have to sign a lease first, then go sure. to the, uh, the feds, the TTB, and then you have to get your license. And then the state won't look at you until you get your TTB license. And, your brewer's notice and then you're up, it's up to the state and then you have the city as well. So there's a lot of powers uh, that control whether you open or not, you know? Um, sure. So that's often a confusing and frustrating process for many startups. You know, if you've been going for a year or two, you know, people like what you're doing. Congratulations. Now what? Um, you know, did you start up with all the boxes checked off properly so you're making good profit? You can take a vacation, you know, pay for all the things that you thought you'd hoped to pay for. Or are you looking at a shortage of product and you need to make more product in order to keep customers happy? And what does that look like? You know, it's, you know, how do you expand? To expand where you are, you know, did you get a lease? Do you rent month to month? How many years is your lease? What's the marketplace look like? I mean, you know, the list of questions is fairly extensive, right? And they all have to be answered properly, or you know, you may put yourself in a worse spot than doing nothing at all, right? And that's where you come in with the uh, brewer consulting brewer, you know, to try to, you know, flush this stuff out. I know you've opened my eyes to a lot of things that I haven't uh, thought about, you know, when I, when I want, you know, looking at this journey to expand and, and where to go from here. Uh, so it's important that you, like you said, tick all the boxes and just plan for the future, you know, and, and that's very uh, capital intensive. You got to make sure your cash flow is the biggest issue that I'm facing, you know, space and cash flow. Those are the, I guess, if you talk to every brewer, that's the two uh, issues that they uh, face when they're moving along. Well, I mean, if you think about it simply, you know, and, and just conversational math, if you're spending $10,000 a month on supplies and you're growing by 10%, you need an extra $1,000 from somewhere. So, you know, depending on what your margin is, and how steady your sales channel is, you may have that thousand bucks to do the the ten percent, you know, that extra grand, or that extra grand may not be reachable because your receivables are thirty to plus days out, and your production cycle is three and a half to five weeks. So in order to meet next month's anticipated demand of a thousand of ten percent more product. You know, you got to find a thousand dollars now. So where do you find the thousand dollars? And then once you solve that, and everyone says, "Hey, he can produce it, or she can produce it," what do we do next month when they want the next thousand yeah. uh, dollars? So now your receivables may have come in. You might have refreshed the thousand dollars that you just spent. But now you need another thousand dollars over what you had just spent the previous time. Yeah. You now it starts to become a vicious cycle of how much can you get out of your cash flow 
and or um, financial services to help you achieve the growth you're looking for. And then I think the question most people don't think about much is because they don't expect it to happen so fast. What did we actually want to achieve in the first place? Mm -hmm. How much is enough? Right. And it's kind of a, it's just a cycle and, and it kind of morphs as, as you move along and you have to constantly, uh, you know, be on top of the numbers and just make sure that, you know, everything is working properly because you could get really buried quickly, you know, if you're not on top of things. And, and Sure. You know, yeah. So, um, so, and, and, you know, one, one of the things I see when I, when I walk into stores, I still see this, um, and that's another reason why I started the podcast is like, I go into maybe a market basket up here. It's a big chain in New England. And I see like 90% is the big beer, um, you know, suitcases of, uh, you know, whatever, you know, you know what I'm talking about? It's like 10.99 for, for 24 cans. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and people keep buying that and they're, they're just not educated on, on, on craft beer and how, how good it is. And, you know, Hey, take that 1099 and buy a six pack of some local beer. You'd be much more satisfied with that than, you know, buying that suitcase of 24 cans. It's better just to buy some water, maybe like a case of water, It'd be more healthier. Uh, but what, what could you tell to, um, you know, what you, could you tell to those people who, who still, you know, drink this, you know, the mass produced beer and try to get them over to the craft beer side? Oh, uh, you know, beer is lifestyle choices. Beer is convenience. Beer is comfort. Beer is social. Beer is many things beyond just beer. You know, otherwise, you know, we'd be talking about yogurt or carrots. And I don't think people talk about yogurt and carrots the same way. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, you know, you can't make someone change their mind. Mm -hmm. You can't tell someone they're wrong. They're just going to dig in deeper. You know, and, and I think that's something that's often lost in the conversation is, you know, there's a way to introduce someone to a flavor that they may have not had before that can be very productive, and there's a way to do it very unproductive. Right. And one of the things that I often hear people talk about is, you know, oh, that this is bad, that's bad, you drink that. Well, you know, when you go after something like that, that way, you're not just going after that, you're going after the person mm -hmm. um, for their choice, right? whether we realize it or not. Mm -hmm. Um, I've done tastings. I used to sell a Belgian style pale ale back in the good old days before IPA <laughs> owned the market. And it was a beautiful beer. It had, um, you know, clear body, a little bit of a noble hop note to it, touch of honey, golden color. It was just six and a half percent of awesome. I love that beer. Um, it was my flagship for many years. People would be like, oh, I hate Blue Moon. Blue Moon's awful. It's a Coors product. Other people would say, it's a Coors product? Blue Moon is Blue Moon. I love Blue Moon. I love Blue Moon as a brewer making Belgian-style pale ale because I'd be like, you like Blue Moon? Try a taste of this. And people would try it, and I'd, I'd say, what do you think? They're like, that's pretty good. Like. <laughs> doesn't have that fruity bubble gummy flavor of blue moon does it they're like no so a little better and more often than not they'd say yeah absolutely and then they'd buy it it was great but without blue moon and the millions and millions of dollars spent on getting that brand as big as it is across the country by miller um I would never have had the opportunity right. to have those conversations to turn people on to my product. Right. So, you know, it, it's something I try to always remember 
Right. You know? I mean, yeah, there is there is a a, a a value in in the larger beers like Blue Moon. All right, it's not a lager. What is this? Okay, it's a uh, like you said, it's a, a Belgian style, but um, it kind of attracts people, and then it kind of takes them the next step, and then you give them a, a proper uh, Belgian style uh, ale, and you know they 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 convert hopefully, you know, or they drink Blue Moon, but they'll they'll also drink your beer and you know maybe more of your beer now since they know what's you know the difference so it's kind of educating yeah, individuals it is but you also have to remember you know in the larger distribution channels i had no presence so uh-huh. in the day-to-day path of the consumer you know it, their average path may not pass through the places that sold the majority of what I did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they may like it, but the opportunity to get it is hard. Right. That's the issue. It's the distribution. And, uh, but you were in a bunch of States when you were, uh, at white birch. Oh yeah. We got up to like 16 States. That's, that's awesome. You know, yeah, it was a different world this, back then. You started it from scratch pretty much, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I started as a 20-gallon brewery in New Hampshire with three stores. Word of mouth. It uh, opened a lot of doors and, and changed how we sold our beer. Right. And um, I met you. I think you were the president of the Granite State uh, Brewer Association. Which is, and then I remember we were sitting around a table when I started. I was, it was only like 20 of us, I think. Uh, and that was in 2013 or 14. Uh, yeah, 2014. And um, now there's 70 plus brewers. I'm not sure how many there are now. Just in New Hampshire. Uh, I heard we've gotten into 80. 80 um, now, yeah. So it, it, it grows like what a day. So, um, you know, the, the, the craft uh, beer uh, movement is, is growing. And, um, you know, according, what, what is the percentage now? I don't know if you know off the top of the head, Brewer Association. I think it's, is it 11% craft brew and then 89 um, larger beer, larger mass produced beer? At a national level? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's around that. It's around that the last time I looked at. So there's, there's still a lot of room for growth. Um, it's just a matter, a matter of, um, you know, educating individuals and, and having them try to look for that local beer. Um, you know, what discourages me too, the, is that when you walk into a restaurant, maybe a larger chain, you know, they'd have, uh, you know, 10 tap lines or, or whatever. And they'd have like maybe one local beer. Um, yeah, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good enough. I mean, you, you should have more local beer on, on tap. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the beers, you know, if you start drinking the, you know, national beers, they they taste the same. It's kind of this chalky taste, you know. It's bizarre, and I don't know what what. It's just kind of a. I, I think it's just deceptive, you know, because it just people don't understand what good beer is, and that that's one of our uh, quests, one of our goals, to educate people on it. Well, you know. One of the things I I tell many brewers, it was something that I talked about as president of the Brewers Association in New Hampshire. Um, We do a lot of preaching to like-minded people, a.k.a. preaching to the choir. Right. But, you know, real growth will happen when we cross that threshold and start bringing new people into the fold. Right. Um, and that I still don't see happening. Right. I mean, that that's what I, I don't see that either. And that's, you know, and I, I've been in, I've been doing this for almost four years and I don't see, you know, we, we see it growing and we see, you know, it ticks, you know, the clock ticks down or, or the, um, the percentage of uh, craft beer, goes up in terms of, um, you know, it used to be, I think when I started, it was like 6% of the the total pie were craft beers and it was seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Now it's 10 plus. So it is, it's a slow, it's a slow process. And, 
there is a lot of anti small brewery local breweries um sentiment out there they have uh you know teams of lawyers you know divisions within companies called disruptive growth where they just go after uh either smaller breweries that are doing well and then buy them out you know and add them to their uh, portfolio which is you know, i mean uh, it, it, I, that's a, that's a yeah uh, so i'm going to say i haven't heard of you know, larger breweries or global entities having legal teams called disruptive. Mm -hmm. I know InBev had their high end group they used to do strategic purchases mm -hmm. of brands around the country. Um, and I don't begrudge the brewers that, you know, the thing most people don't understand is there isn't a succession plan for most breweries. They're open by passionate people run uh, and then eventually you reach a point where you want to transition out there aren't a lot of transition opportunities historically for people that own breweries um you know a number of brewers in the post mid 90s collapse through 2006 closed auctioned off their stuff because they didn't have family members um, or a way to capitalize the brewery for an employee purchase, you know, stock purchase program to get the value out of the business, you know. So um, to say that there's a, a group out there trying to go after small brewers, there's over 6,000 breweries in the country now. Right. There wasn't even 1,200 in 2009. There are too many brewers. The barriers to entry are gone for so there's too many breweries out there for any global entity to try to stop um the only ways that i'm seeing pushback is in certain states where there are restrictive sales limits um that were repealed that the uh, groups are trying to bring back um, but in general if you want to open a brewery you know, there's there's many ways to do it. Mm -hmm. What makes you different and what makes you successful is still the same opportunity today that it was last year, five years ago, ten years ago. The internet has changed everything. Right. Yeah. Social media. You know, you don't need a huge marketing budget. I mean, marketing is 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 important, very important, but. Um, I mean, you get followings on on pages. You say, "Hey, I'm gonna we're launching a, a new beer," and then you got a line out the door trying to buy that beer. Um, a bunch of breweries, you know, locally have done that. Sure, the the phenomenon of waiting in line to get a beer. Uh, some breweries get it and see it happen on more of their releases. Others never achieve that. I was never a big fan of it. I always believed if I had a hot hand, and I had some, I put it out in the stores that sold it for me so that my supporters via my retailers, that third tier, could uh, benefit from some of what I did as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, that's 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 kind of what we do too. I mean, if we have some special release, we we'll just have it in the tap room. I mean, we made the the cake was nuts. That was the only that was one of the things that it was just an experiment. You know, we took our our porter and we infused cold brew coffee, and then we people want, wanted a uh, they're like, hey, why don't you make a, a a chocolate mousse stout? I'm like, nah, I don't know, chocolate mousse. You know, I don't know, it has milk or could curdle, you know, at 50 degrees. That's so we keep the beer at 50 degrees for ales. Uh, so I was just thinking about it. What, what's stable at, uh, you know, shelf temperature? And uh, I'm like, oh, Oreos, you know. So we, mm -hmm. uh, we we make cake. And you know the story about cake. Uh, we just, you know, blended up and made 30 gallons, uh, blended up like 20 pounds of Oreos and, you know, infused it in and said, hey, we're going to have cake on, on Friday evening. And then they they launched it put it on tap friday evening and you know by sunday morning it was gone sure and uh it, it, i mean it sold so well that we, we now we can it we have the 16 ounce cans 
which is another another phenomenon. And I don't know. I wish everybody would stay with bottles because when I originally started it, we had the, the bombers, the twenty two ounce bombers, which was which was awesome. Uh, but now everything's trending towards cans. Um, and what do you think the real reason is uh, for, for cans? Why why is it so appealing to everybody? They keep saying everybody keeps saying, yeah, you can put it in your backpack when you go hiking. I'm like, who really does that? You know. <laughs> it really does that. Is that a reason to put it in cans? I don't know. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been challenging for us, but we, we had to figure it out because it's just the packaging. I mean, the beer is the same. It's just the packaging, which, um, which drives the sales. So what do you think about that? Well, I think, um, I think it was something that was a long time coming and it's a convergence of a few trends. Um, Oscar Blues has been carrying the banner for a long time. Um, and then, you know, in New Hampshire, you saw Moat Mountain doing 16 ounce cans. Um, the technology for canning used to be unobtainable for small brewers. Um, you wanted to can, you were looking at a multi million dollar line, high speed way beyond the needs or volume of a small producer. Um, you know, Crown Crown really put a stamp on it and a face to it. Um, and they were first to market with the viable, you know, 30, 35 can a minute canning line. And they solved these, the, the um, packaging a supply problem as well by offering a ready-made solution for, you know, supplying brewers the products in less than 18 wheeler uh, allotments or 25 pallets. So it made it convenient. It made it affordable. And, you know, the drop in weight versus glass uh, not needing labels, neck labels, caps, six pack holders, four pack holders, cases, reels of tape, and acres of machinery. Suddenly, you could produce a fair amount of beer in a convenient, uh, price friendly format, and customers loved it. And then you had, um, Wild Goose and American Beer is the other top two lines. And I think personally, American Beer has put some really innovative stuff into their canning lines to make it, you know, the go to leader in the marketplace for canning. Um, but once those genies were out, you know, people just don't go back. I mean, for the longest time, 22s were awesome, but, you know, it was the unusual beer. Ooh, what's in a 22? 22s were new. 22s were cutting edged. If you bought a beer in the 22, it was going to be something extreme. Well, once you get used to the extreme beers and you have a taste for it, it's like, uh, yeah, I'd love an extreme beer, but $18 for a 22-ounce bottle of beer or eleven ninety nine for a six-pack. Yeah, I'll get the six-pack today. I'll save the 22 for a treat. It's just human nature. Right. And when the technology became attainable to more brewers, you know, it just yeah, trend fed itself. And once people realized that canned beer tastes good and meant quality, like the 22s used to, and all their esoteric favorite flavors were now at a much more affordable price, um, yeah, you aren't getting that one back. No. I know. We still sell them in the tap room. I mean, people buy the 22s. But we're not we're not $18 a bottle. I mean, it's more like 8, but <laughs> yeah, for for margin for margin sake, it's not good for uh brewers, but um I mean, you got to produce a lot of it. But we're a small brewery. We're getting it done and and we're getting it into uh 
uh, larger stores uh, like Hannaford. We're in Hannaford, but we can't. We got to be careful so that we keep enough on hand because they they go through it quickly. Uh, we can only produce so much. But um, so yeah, I'd like to try to. You know, I know we're running out of time, but I want to give you this last uh, uh, question. There's uh, uh, what is your favorite beer of all time, and and what is your favorite beer out now? You know that's that's a frustratingly American question. What's your favorite <laughs> beer of all time? Give me one. Um, ask a chef what his favorite food is. Mm-hmm. He isn't going to give you one item. I had a number of influences over time, um, and each one really, you know, impacted my perspective on beer and brewing. Chimay Grand Reserve. Allagash, the white, the double reserve, yeah. the four. Um, Brother Adams, Braggett, Young's, Old Nick, Barley Wine. Barley Wine, holy cow, that's an amazing app. beer that's just unloved as a style these days. Right. You know, uh, La Folie, oh, before they pasteurized it, if you could get one of those white whales, Damn, St. Bernardus, St. Bernardus, you know, um, quack. I mean, now these seem to be a lot of, uh, these are a lot of imports, huh? Yeah, a bunch of them. Yeah. You know, that was the old world styles, the yin to the yang of the American macro lager. Guinness extra stout for an extra stout. Holy cow, the first time I had a black beer. That oh, yeah. was that was heaven. That's what we struggle with. Everybody sees dark beer, they just run the other way and we have to just kind of convince them. You were talk you were touching on it before, uh, about you know, having them try it at least. Yeah, you know, they come into the tap room like at least try it. It's I know it's dark, but it's really good. Try it. And then they try it and they're like, Oh, this is this is good. You know, give me a pint. Sure. sure. So it's just trying to get them to uh just at least try it. It's like, you know, and it's good. Yeah, I mean, these days I've been enjoying lagers a lot more because we're starting to see some more brewers doing that. Um, Black Hog, uh, their lager, damn, that's good. Um, You know, the, um, oh gosh, the uh, Vermonters, um, damn it, I forgot, they have a Hell's Lager. Um, the sound of music, loggers. Oh, Ugh. Von Trapp. Thank you. The Von <laughs> Trapp Hell's Lager. I picked up a couple of those, and I'm like, "Holy cow!" It's I think good. I need to get a keg I gotta go of either of those. I got to go up there and check them out. I got to make a trip to Vermont and just hang out there for for. A uh, while. I've been to Von Trapp. It's an amazing place. It's yeah. worth worth the visit. Absolutely. Um. But, you know, those are both phenomenal examples of beautiful, well-made lagers. Um, you know, other beers I've had and enjoyed, you know, I mean, number of New England IPAs, you know, uh, Mighty Squirrel, you know, Cosmic Distortion. I'm like, i had not a fan of IPA, but okay. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's the New England IPA with all the Halo hops without the lines in the waiting, you know? Right. Um, your uh, cake. I, I'm i like, it's Oreos. But it's actually a pretty tasty beer. I liked it. <laughs> oh, so uh, damn you. you for putting fucking cookies in a <laughs> beer and making it taste good. <laughs> we make it. It's bastardization I, I, of like, everything that's holy in the beer world. I know the Germans would forget about it, but all you know, but hey, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it's food. I, I think it's food. I'm Italian. I'm like it's food. You know, we gotta. If you, sure, could eat I mean, it, you could you could drink it. You know, we 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 also do the buffalo. You know, the buffalo wing and wing, wing and fu- uh, sauce infused uh, pale ale. Which sounds yeah, like no, nuts. I mean, you know, it's like who uh, would think that, you know? But we just experiment with things, and it, and it works out. I won't drink beers with hot peppers in it. I love hot food, but you put hot peppers or stuff in a beer, and I'll be like, no, thank you. 
Yeah. Um, you got to try it. You got to try it. No, I don't. No, <laughs> but thank you. My philosophy, though, is, you know, I, I've been making beer since 94, and it doesn't seem that long to me until I meet someone who's 22. Um, <laughs> but I'm interested in someone's take on a beer. You made it. You deemed it worth selling. You put it in a can, a bottle, in my glass. So when I taste it, I'm curious. How do I like it? How does it present? Is it a classical take on the style? Is it an alternative take on the style? Do I enjoy it? Would I really want to have two glasses of this? Um, the answer is not always yes. And sometimes the answer is, oh, yeah, I'll buy a whole bunch of this. But I think that's the fun in beer. You know, you're not bound by strict rules. And, you know, if you're going to make a statement, great. Don't tell me it's 10 cents a, an ounce cheaper and that's your claim to fame. Tell me why I should drink it and make it a statement that makes me want to come back and drink it. You know, and if you hit those marks, it's awesome and I should buy more. I'm going to buy more. And I'm going to appreciate it. So, you know, it's kind of how I look at it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this has been a great conversation, um, uh, Bill. Maybe you can tell people how they can find you in case they needed, uh, you know, some uh, consulting with their brewery or just to kind of talk to somebody. Yeah, I'm going to open a brewery and, you know, what do I do and what kind of equipment? Uh, where can they find you? Sure. Uh, BrewerConsultingBrewer.com. Very simple. Uh, contact form is on there. Hits my phone. Uh, the joys of modern technology. Um, happy to chat with you and see if we might be able to help you out. Yeah, that's great. And I can attest to the fact Bill has been very um, you know, instrumental in guiding me towards this next level. And uh, I would uh, wholeheartedly, uh, you know, you know, recommend him uh, if you're if you're thinking about opening a brewery or if you have some idea around beer. You know, just give him a give him a shout. And uh, but Bill, I I appreciate you and I appreciate you coming on the uh, the podcast. And uh, we're episode two, which is awesome, and I appreciate it. And uh, well, thanks for having me, Michael. No, I appreciate it, brother. All right, uh, thanks very much. Have a good night. All right, man. Yeah, wow, that was some great information uh, from Bill Herlica. And uh, yeah, he just knows a lot about beer and trends. And, you know, he's just a wealth of knowledge. I always call him and, and bounce stuff off of him. Um, he's trying to help me uh, expand into the new, a new brewery um, or new new ideas. Uh, and he's been very instrumental in that. So if you, if you, you know, I encourage you to, to get in touch with him if you have any beer questions at all. Uh, you just shoot him an email, you know, brewerconsultingbrewer.com, and he can help you out. Well, that's it for today. And, uh, you know, we got more coming your way. So stay tuned. Subscribe to this podcast. If you like what you heard, give us a uh, review on iTunes. Tell a friend, you know, that gets people involved. And, you know, we just want to promote uh, craft beer, uh, not just, uh, you know, in New England, not just in the U.S., but around the world. So we'll have a lot of people on and just uh, expand knowledge on craft beer and let people know that there is an alternative that they can have and enjoy okay so we'll see you guys next week take care